So uh, as Edge mentioned, I'm a director of what with, uh, visual, uh, Waterloo Visualization Group, which is part of the big HCI lab at the uh, School of Computer Science. And more information can be uh, found on my website uh, at the link here. So today I'm going to talk about uh, power the people with data, a introduction to information visualization. I'm going to give you a very brief uh, introduction about InfoViz and also uh, peek into my uh, current research. So I'd like to start with talking about the history. So especially the significant industrial revolution that we have experienced. So for the first industrial revolution, we invented the steam engine. And then for the second, we discovered electricity. And those two uh, industrial revolutions greatly increase our uh, society of productivity. And for the third one, we have the computers, uh, IT system, which generate uh, automated uh, product lines, production lines. And right now here, we are at the so-called uh, Industry 4.0, uh, where we have uh, IoT, cloud computing, machine learning, AI, and robotics, uh, which can do tons of tasks replacing humans for um, and increasing the productivity of humans. So what are the common aspects of these four industrial revolutions in human history? Think about it. What are the commonalities? So what I found is it is either about the information or about the energy or both. So the human productivity strongly relates to our abilities of managing information and energy. Um, just to give you an example, for example, Tesla, we all know that, okay, it is a car uh, maker, but it is actually a information plus energy company. So it, it produces electronic cars, so that is on the energy aspect, and also it possesses a big, uh, a lot of lot of data, a lot of information, and try to uh, do autopilot, self-driving cars. And another example I can think of is the GPU, CPU uh, chips that uh, we deal with every day. It it has lower and lower power consumption, but stronger and stronger computation abilities. So this is also about uh, lower the energy, but increasing the throughput of uh, processing information. So today's talk is about information, but not about energy. So how can we deal with this massive overwhelming energy, uh, sorry, overwhelming information today? Um, we have a big data and information overload. You heard those kind of uh, buzzwords all the time. So I still want to go back to the human history. So human has limitations. And so we invent tools for assistance. So our ancestors use stones, uh, bones as tools to hunt, cook food, and even make new tools. And these new tools will create even more new tools, right? So the efficiency of the tools actually significantly matters the productivity of human. So what about data? information. These, this is very abstract. So how can we deal with that? What do we do? We rely on digital tools. So think about how many apps do you use per day? Maybe in the morning you have uh, an alarm app and right now we are using um, the video conferencing app to communicate due to COVID-19 and you're using Word, Excel, PowerPoint to process, uh, analyze and present data and you're using Instagram, Facebook, or whatever to communicate with your friends, right? So we have tons of digital tools. We are surrounded by lots and lots of digital tools. So from the functional point of view, information visualization is the tools for exploring, analyzing, presenting, and even generating data or information. So this is only from the uh, functional point of view. Um, Stuhlkar in 1999 uh, defined the InfoViz as the use of computer-supported interactive visual representation abstract data to amplify cognition. So this is kind of like a commonly uh, agreed uh, definition of information visualization. So what are the characteristics of InfoViz? What can we learn from this definition? So the first key point 
is visual representation. So InfraVis utilize human visual perception because visual channel is the human sense that has the highest bandwidth compared to hearing, uh, taste, uh, touch. So InfraVis here is to use visual representations to leverage human visual perception. And the second point is human machine interaction and collaboration. So you see in the definition, you see computer supported interactive and abstract data. So together, InfoViz is the bridge between human and the machine and human and machine should collaborate together to export data. That is the ultimate goal, which brings to our final uh, key points in this definition, amplify cognition. So the optimal goal of the information visualization is to explore and discover insights in complicated data. And together, this definition tells us we, in general, we want to improve the human efficiency and overcome human limitation in processing massive information. So this sounds maybe a little bit abstract. So let me give you some concrete examples. So I have a friend whose name is Mary, and she's a data scientist at IT company. And one day she found me, uh, she, she said, um, I have a problem. Then my, my input data looks very similar, but my classifier performed dramatically different. I, I don't know why. By input data look, looking similar, she means a lot of stats like mean, standard deviations, correlations look exactly the same. So I said, okay, why don't you visualize your data? Let's plot them. If you plot your data, you can even find dinosaurs in your data. So all of those data sets here are, they are having exactly the same mean standard vision correlations. But if you see them in the charts in visualization, you can see that they are actually dramatically different data sets. So this is actually from a, a Kai 2017 paper. So you know that I actually making up the story is not Mary is not my real friend, but the, the key point here is using visualization can help you to detect the nuance uh, in data. Sometimes the descriptive statistics are not always precise. They may deceive you, right? So, but I have to continue my story. So my friend Mary, uh, come back to me. Okay, now we know um, we have very complicated data set. We have dramatically different characteristic data set. But I have another problem. She's building a neural network classifier and tries so many ways, but doesn't work. She doesn't know why, because the deep neural network is some kind of like a black box. Without knowing how the model works, it's hard to define or determine which method to use. So again, we could use visualization. This is the uh, TensorFlow playground uh, where you can see the internal um, changing of uh, this very simple uh, uh, vanilla neural network. So it is a classification task. You can see how the decision boundaries is changing while the model is learning. And then you can also see how each neuron views the data. So with visualization, you can easily open the black box to determine how the uh, model works. That's another benefit of visualization. Finally, um, Mary got some very good results, but when she presented the result to her um, a manager, a manager does not appreciate that because all the results is presented in this kind of table or form is hard to understand. It might be easy to understand by a uh, computer scientist or much much learning uh, engineer, but if the audience is not very technical. This kind of presentation actually is not very effective. So again, visualization can be applied to improve the storytelling part of data. So by that, I'd like to show you a video, a short clip video, which from Hans Rosling about this uh, visual representation of uh, storytelling about data. So here we go. First, an axis for health, life expectancy from 25 years to 75 years. And down here, an axis for wealth, income per person, 400, 4,000, and $40,000. So down here is poor and sick, and up here is rich and healthy. Now, I'm going to show you the world 200 years ago in 1810. Here come all the countries. Europe brown, Asia red, Middle East green, Africa south of Sahara blue, and the Americas yellow. And the size of the country bubble show the size of the population. 
And in 1810, it was pretty crowded down there, wasn't it? All countries were sick and poor. Life expectancy were below 40 in all countries. And only the UK and the Netherlands were slightly better off, but not much. And now, why start the world? The Industrial Revolution makes countries in Europe and elsewhere move away from the rest. But the colonized countries in Asia and Africa, they are stuck down there. And eventually, the Western countries get healthier and healthier. And now, we slow down to show the impact of the First World War and the Spanish flu epidemic. What a country. And now I speed up through the 1920s and the 1930s. And in spite of the Great Depression, Western countries forge on towards greater wealth and health. Japan and some others try to follow, but most countries stay down here. Now, after the tragedies of the Second World War, we stop a bit to look at the world in 1948. 1948 was a great year. The war was over. Sweden topped the medal table at the Winter Olympics, and I was born. But the differences between the countries of the world was wider than ever. The United States was in the front. Japan was catching up. Brazil was way behind. Iran was getting a little richer from oil, but still had short lives. And the Asian giants, China, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh and Indonesia, they were still poor and sick down here. So it's a very, very compelling way of showing data. And it's like, 100, in 100 years, you have a uh, uh, dramatic change in the world. All right. Okay, so hopefully you, 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 you are convinced that our information visualization is easy, uh, is effective for uh, analyzing the data, presenting the data, and also looking to uh, complicated models. To summarize, I like to use this comic. Um, so you have the raw information. And if you apply machine learning models or any, any kind of analy analytical methods, you get knowledge. And if you involve human in, into it, you will get more creativity. So that is the um, interesting part of InfoViz. It combines human, machine, um, and data. So what is the construct of information visualization? I already mentioned there's human, machine, and data. So how exactly do they work together? So researchers have uh, proposed uh, some um, mental models about visualization. So here you have the data, and on the other end, you have the user. In the middle, you have the machine, which is uh, display the visualization or system, right? So from this data, the system can generate visualization and the visualization will be perceived as an image by the user. And when the user perceives this image, the user will gain knowledge. And the user can explore more to gain more knowledge little by little, little by little. So in the end, they'll gain more and more knowledge. So it forming this kind of knowledge gaining loop. But at a certain point, the user need to explore or externalize um, his or her thought and use that as a specification or manipulation to the system, which should change the visualization. This path represents that the visualization needs to be interactive. Visualization is not about generating one beautiful image and that's it. It is about involving the user and making the user to gradually manipulate the, the system and changing the image and get new uh, perceive knowledge from the data. So this model, uh, the fact that like is, is strictly um, tightly combined the data visualization and user, which is the very uh, three important parties in this ecosystem. Okay, now you know, okay. Um, visualization is very helpful and can export data. So let's just use visualization to export data. But in fact, there are huge challenges in using visualization to export data. So for example, you're given a spreadsheet like this and, and I just ask you, okay, can you find some insights about it? So you may select some parts and generate a chart and then you think about it, select another part, generate another chart and then gener generate another chart and another chart. 
But do you notice any problems? So this first problem is there are too much data and you don't know which part of the data you want to explore. And the other problem is you don't know what kind of visualization to use. You could use pie chart, bar chart, line chart. And also you don't know, you don't have a holistic view about what's have been done and what they're going to do later. So basically you're lost in this data exploration. Just to summarize, the two big challenges are, first, you're lacking a holistic view of the visual analysis space. So what is the current status, where you are now, and what, have been, uh, what has been explored? And the second is you have to make decisions in this very large parameter space. So there are numerous ways of mapping from the data variables to the uh, visualization uh, encodings to generate visualization. So which data variable do you, do you use, do you explore, and what kind of charts do you use? So having those challenges, you may not be able to use the visualization effectively, at least for a lot of uh, uh, non-experts. So this will motivate um, one research, actually, uh, one of my recent work um, about using machine learning and machine intelligence to support this kind of exploratory uh, data analysis. So the system name is called Charts Theory, and I'm going to show you a quick video clip about the, about the system. So here, what you see. Um, so down below here is the raw data, and here's you have a two-dimensional kind of projection about all the charts that you have created. So each circle here is a chart that you have already created. And this space characterized by the similarity between all the charts you have created. Uh, so you have different clusters of charts. And with this, you will be able to identify some kind of gap uh, in your analysis. For example, here, you see there are not many charts generated. So possibly this is um, a new opportunity. And you have all the existing chart that you have already created listed here. And let me play, as I say. So you can hover over on each uh, circular grid to see exactly what the charts is. This is like a bar chart. If you click, you will have the details shown here. And uh, by looking at this map of analysis, you can click the empty space to ask for recommendations from the system. And the recommendation will show on the right side and generated by the system. You can explore the recommendations. If you're not uh, satisfied, you can click again to curate that, okay, I want to explore this local area more in my analysis space. And then if you're satisfied with certain recommendation, you can still tweak because the machines are not, are not uh, perfect. So you can tweak the machine generated charts and add it to your exploration history. So that is the very short uh, introduction about the tool. Uh, a lot of technical details can be found in the paper. Um, but I just want to mention um, one thing. It looks very simple. So you just click somewhere in the empty space. You will be able to um, get recommended charts. So how did we achieve that? So what we do, what we are doing is we use machine learning to map uh, to find the mapping between a chart and a high dimensional vector. So we train a decoder, a, a encoder and decoder um, to convert from and to the visualization um, uh, latent variables. So by using the decoder, we can convert any chart into a vector. So we will be able to generate this kind of summarization by just simply computing their similarity based on this vector. And use the decoder, which is the reverse process uh, we can do a uh, recommendation. So if the user clicks somewhere in the empty space, we will get a vector. And that vector can be input to the, to the decoder to generate new charts. So you have this loop. I don't want to go into too much technical details, but more information can be found in, uh, in my paper. So now we have introduced a lot of stuff about the goods about visualization. But what are the bads? Actually, visualization can lie. So for example here, this is a real chart I get uh, from New York Times. It shows the willingness to get vaccine in the United States. So what's wrong with this chart? So after looking at the chart, uh, 
at first glance, I ask myself, why on earth in, uh, people in Wyoming never want to get vaccine? Is there anything wrong? But actually, when you look closer, the white pale color is actually, based on the color map, it actually does not represent zero. It's actually start from 68%. So this color scale does not from start from zero, but the color, the white color in our perception combination system, we will view this at a glance. We will think that, okay, there's no data there or people just don't want to get a vaccine. It's representing zero. So you can see that the harmonies of um, using wrong color scale or wrong uh, scale uh, on, the, on the visualization. So you can actually communicate uh, wrong information if you're not using visualization correctly. All right, that will conclude my um, talk. And this last slide, if you notice the background, it is actually a visualization of the uh, history. It is a spatial temporal kind of visualization. The x-axis the map uh, is the time, and the y-axis is actually the um, spatial uh, dimension. So you see the Rome Empire occupied a lot of the space in the history, but it was it split into different countries later. So yeah, by looking at history, we understand a lot of uh, insights, and using visualization, we can even better uh, manage the information that we, we are seeing today and hopefully that will provide some uh, future directional insights to you all right uh, that's it thanks very much for listening and uh, any question i'll happy to answer that